So we've seen that the minute we think that there is a such thing as a standard by which we can judge people to be virtuous or good, that that implies a goal or a purpose or an intention behind their existence, a creation, and thus God. But this produces a new problem, a problem that doesn't exist simply because there is a God, but because beside there being a God, there's something we are even more aware of, and that is evil. The philosopher Epicurus put it this way, where does evil come from if there's a God? But where does good come from if there isn't? So it isn't just that there's a problem of evil and that evil then shows there is no God. But if there is no God, then there doesn't seem to be a standard by which we can judge virtue or goodness. So really what we have here is dilemma. And in our study of Boethius, it becomes especially a problem, as we're going to see. So let's outline the problem first, the general problem of evil, if there is a perfectly good and powerful God. But then let's show how it was first answered by Augustine, and then how that answer can't be satisfactory for every case, especially the case which many of us find ourselves in, and which is really the story of Boethius's life, as we're going to see. So what's the problem of evil? Well, one way to put it is, look, if God could, he would prevent evil, but God's all powerful, right? So he could. So if he could, he would, because God being perfect is good and therefore hates evil. He could prevent evil, therefore he would. But look, there is evil. So either he couldn't or he wouldn't. If he couldn't, he's not all powerful and therefore not God. If he wouldn't, he's not all good. He's indeed evil and therefore not God. So this is the traditional problem of evil. Because God is all powerful, he could prevent evil. Because he's all good, he would prevent evil. But look, there is plenty of evil in the world. And so therefore, there's a problem with the existence of God. But again, we can't end there and say, all right, there is no God, because the minute we say that, there is no good either, and therefore no evil. And so what we really have is a dilemma. If there is evil, then where does it come from? Why does God allow it to, to, to happen? But if there is no God, then where does good come from in the first place? Now, Augustine, very famous Christian philosopher that unfortunately we just don't have time to read in this course, wrote a book about this called On Freedom of the Will. And while I was talking about this, you probably yourself, those of you who believe in God, were thinking of the very answer which he first came up with. And that is, of course there's evil in the world. There had to be at least the possibility of evil because God made us free to disobey or to reject God and to reject the good. And that is called the free will defense. The idea behind it is, why would God give us such a dangerous thing as free will if it could bring in such things as the Holocaust or genocide or nuclear weapons or environmental collapse or racism or <clears throat> misogyny? All of these things needed to be possible because without their possibility, there could be no possibility of morally good creatures. We saw when we were looking at Aristotle that free will or freedom of choice is what makes us responsible for our actions. And without that responsibility, we're mere automatons or robots that, that whatever we do has no moral significance or value. A robot can't be morally good or evil, no matter what the consequences of the actions of that robot. And so if God created creatures that only did what God wanted, that had no freedom to reject God, then we could neither say that they truly love God or love the good. They're just doing what they're programmed to do. So if God wants a morally good universe, God has to create a universe where it's possible for humans to reject the good 
reject God and do evil? And this is such a good answer, and it is a necessary part of an incomplete answer, but it doesn't answer one fundamental problem which we all at some point in our lives will find ourselves in. One way to put it is this. Okay, so there are evil people and there are good people. Shouldn't good people be rewarded for being good? They freely chose to do so. Shouldn't they have a good life? What about those evil people? Shouldn't they be punished right away for their evil? If God is good, isn't God just? But don't we find just the opposite? Boethius's case is a great example. Boethius was famous for his virtue. He was the one clean politician in Roman government at the time. He lived during a time when Rome, the Western Empire, had just collapsed and had come under the control of a barbarian king named Theodoric. Theodoric nominally gave allegiance to the Eastern Roman Empire, Emperor and therefore wrote, you know, kept the forms of Roman government, like the Senate and councils. And Boethius, who is a very famous philosopher, the smartest man alive at that time, knowing every language in existence and writing about every subject from logic to theology and physics, and knowing all of the ancient philosophers, gave up that life to do his duty and serve what he believed to still be the Roman Empire. The problem was Theodoric didn't want that allegiance. He nominally said he had allegiance to the emperor, but he really wanted to keep the Gothic state an independent state. And so Boethius, in striving to maintain the Senate and keep it from being persecuted by Theodoric, was falsely accused by the Senate itself of treason to Theodoric. Theodoric had him arrested and eventually he was placed under house arrest, but eventually he was then tortured. And then after being tortured for several days, he was bludgeoned to death and killed. You ever hear the saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Isn't that life? Have you ever done something really good and just got kicked in the face for doing it? Well, that's Boethius' life. And so he's sitting in jail waiting and knowing the type of horrible death he will incur because he was a good person. And so he cries out in complaint, why would God allow me to suffer when all I've done is good? And this isn't just Boethius' problem. I've had you watch a video before this called Night and Fog, which is the original footage of the Holocaust taken by the Germans themselves. They were so proud of their destruction and genocide that they took video of the actual mass murder as if they were proud of it. I'm sure after you watch this, you couldn't eat anything for a while. After I watched it, I had to go to the bathroom. I couldn't continue watching it. I had you watch it for one reason, the problem of evil is not a theoretical problem. It's a problem that hits us right here where we live. We experience it, but you need to experience it in such a way that you feel horror. Otherwise, this is not a question that you would really want to deal with. But we have to deal with it because our world is still in danger of the very kinds of evil that are constantly perpetrated against the good by the unjust. Why do they flourish? You can't say because of free will, because this isn't the problem of what choices we make. This is the problem of how God reacts to those choices. It seems as if good people suffer and evil people flourish. And that's God's problem. So the problem is God's rule, how God reacts to this. Why does God allow the unjust to flourish? This is Boethius's problem. This is our problem. Unless we solve this problem, then the whole question of whether goodness is good for you gets called into question. See, Aristotle said that happiness is virtue, right? But what if being virtuous leads to unhappiness and tragedy? What if being virtuous means you are going to be tortured and killed, crucified maybe? 
So this is the problem of the book. How do, even though humans have free will, how do we answer the question of God's justice? We cannot say there is no God because there's such good evidence as Boethius has proven. And without a God, there is no virtue or good. We cannot say there is a God because the minute we say there is the God, then we have this problem of injustice. We're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. So, the question of the book. Boethius is sitting in his cell, crying his eyes out, knowing he's lost everything of value for being good. The form of the book that the book takes is of a vision, a vision of philosophy as a woman. Philosophy, again, is reason coming to him to answer the question. So Boethius believes that this is not something that you have to wait for God to tell you about, that your own human reason, that philosophy itself can help us with an answer to this problem and therefore give us consolation even in our worst sorrow and grief. And that is why the book is called The Consolation of Philosophy. This book was so popular that it was the bestseller throughout the ages all the way up to the time of Queen Elizabeth I. And she actually even attempted a translation from Greek into English. If you've read Dante's Inferno, you will know that Dante pretty much had the consolation of philosophy by his side while he wrote all three cycles of his trilogy. And so this book is probably, beside the Bible, one of the most influential books ever to talk about what the meaning of life is, why should I be good, and how can I face unjust suffering in what seems to be a cold and cruel universe. And in a way where God himself seems to be an unjust tyrant.